Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. This is Jason, Certified Financial Planner and host of Fighting Words Financial. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something pretty serious. I wanted to talk to you about the Chinese electric vehicle industry in general and the fact that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Now, I know that Mark Twain is credited with saying that, but I don't think he actually did. But what I really wanted to say is we are entering an age of wonders uh, there's absolutely no way of predicting who the long-term winners are in the Chinese electric vehicle market space. And it looks a lot like the early 1900s did in the United States. If you guys see all this information scrolling past you and all these company names and dates scrolling past you on the left-hand side here, you're going to see that this is a list of defunct automakers. And this is just a list for the United States. I am not going to string this out for, any, for longer than I have to, but I am going to tell you that there are 1,600 companies on this list that went out of business. The only car maker producing cars today that was founded, let's say, in the period between 1900 and 1940 that's not on this list is Ford. Every other company went out of business. Even though GM exists today, it's not the same company that it, that it was before 2009. They went through a bankruptcy, they had you know reorganization, and all of that equity value was lost. Now, if you look in this time period of 1900 to 1940, there's a lot of companies that were founded. Like Ford Motor Company was founded in 1903, but it really didn't become successful until the Model T was produced in uh, 1908, I think before they, they produced the Model A. Now, what really made it successful is that it was a cheap and easily maintainable vehicle, uh, which was cheap enough that the masses could afford it. But what really was the magic formula for success? Like, why was Ford able to vanquish all of their competitors? And is there going to be some sort of similar mechanism that winnows the ranks of new electric vehicle companies popping up everywhere around the world right now? So like I said, on this list that's scrolling by right now, there are over 1,600 companies. Now, 1,030 of them, at least, were founded between 1900 and 1940. That number is actually larger than 1,030. That's literally just where I got tired and stopped counting. I got like to the letter S like halfway through it, and I'm like, I'm tired. I'm not going to count anymore. Over 1,000 of these companies were founded between 1900 and 1940. These weren't all fly-by-night companies. Even the majority of them weren't fly-by-night companies. Most of them uh, existed for years. Every single one of them produced cars, and a lot of them produced cars and trucks for decades. Even like Anheuser-Busch produced their own cars for like 10 years, their own delivery vehicles. 99% of these companies failed in that same time period between 1900 and 1940. In fact, all but one of those companies eventually failed, and that was Ford. You know, many of these companies went public on one stock exchange or another here in the United States. And the most common return for any company stock, any car company stock, has historically been a 100% loss. Now, if you were alive in 1903 and had $1,000 to invest in any car company, what would have made you pick Henry Ford? This was a guy who had already failed twice with two other car companies. He made an electric uh, quadra bicycle or whatever, and then he also was part of the Detroit Motor Company, ended up pulling out of that. He had already actually declared bankruptcy twice and, and failed to produce a profitable company. What would have convinced you to, uh, to invest with him, because he did have 28 original investors, and how would you have known what his formula for success would be? Keep watching this list as it scrolls by to understand the scale of just how competitive things were. And if you notice as you go along on this list, there's actually a shocking uh, number of companies that were actually electric car companies that were founded in that same time period between 1900 and 1940. This really is a technology that has seen a century, more than a century of evolution at this point. Now, some other wise man once said that there are people that don't know where the market is going, and there are people that don't know that they don't know where the market is going. Now, I'm an EV enthusiast, and I have to admit that I'm fascinated by the revolution that is coming. Actually, not the revolution that's coming. It's already here. And in fact, if you don't realize that it's already here and that electric vehicles are going to replace your internal combustion engine over the next decade or two, in fact, you won't even be able to find internal combustion engines other than as a, you know, as a specialist type vehicle or as a curiosity item, you won't be able to find them in a couple of years just because margins on electric vehicles are going to be so much higher. So I'm fascinated by the EV industry and I've held Tesla since uh, late 2011. And I hold NEO. I've held it since 2018. I am cutting my position a little bit by about 30%. But uh, NEO still is a significant portion of my portfolio, and I have a significant number of shares. I see a lot of people who are investing in the EV space 
with dangerous levels of concentration in a single stock, mostly in the Chinese uh, EV market. They have a high conviction that their chosen EV company is going to be the next Tesla, but not a lot of rationale for that high level of conviction. Especially if you don't speak Chinese and don't have trusted contacts in the country, um, you're not really getting the best information. Now, there's no doubt that EVs are here to stay and are going to be the most dominant mode of transportation in the world. In the future of the overall market, you know, that the pie, if you will, of, of EV sales is just going to grow and grow and grow. And so are the slices that each company is, is going to have. But look, I have investments in China here, but I urge caution. We're only getting a small slice of the information we need to make investing decisions in China. They simply don't have the same level of disclosure requirements or the same level of uh, you know, a commitment to their accounting principles. Now, what we're mostly getting information from is companies that have ADRs that are traded on U.S. exchanges or Chinese companies that went public in the U.S. via reverse mergers recently. Uh, companies like NEO, Xping, and Li, and then uh, BYD, which is traded as, a, as an ADR. We get massively biased information when we research these companies, and a lot of that is fed by social media. I mean, really, how much do you know about the hundred or so other car makers in China that are traded on the Hong Kong or Shanghai exchange or privately held, all of which are planning to make their own electric vehicles? Did you even know that the uh, Wuling Mini EV in its first month of sales in July 2020 sold 7,348 units? That was actually the most of any EV company uh, in all of China in uh, July, and only Tesla sold more electric vehicles that month. Did you even know that the Wuling Mini EV existed? Access to investor communities through social media and algorithms that feed our enthusiasm that many have for these stocks are really warping our perception of the true level of risk and reward for concentration in any particular single stock it might not be making us better informed. It actually might be making us just more biased. Look, I know I'm gonna catch a lot of flack for this uh, without providing you too much detail, but there are a few really good reasons to believe that Xpeng uh, is eventually going to eat Neo's lunch. They have the backing of multinational massive corporations just like Neo does. They have government support just like Neo does. They produce a great product just like Neo does but they have the real possibility to bury NEO with volume production. They're targeting a much larger but slightly down market section of the Chinese population, and they actually own their own factory. They have one that's completed that's producing the P7. I'll be making another video to discuss that pretty soon. I'm gonna discuss some of the potential advantages that Xpeng has in their space. You know, from an outside abstract perspective, I'm absolutely mesmerized by the thought of all of the wealth destruction that is going on in connection with the internal combustion engine and all that's going to occur in the future. Possibly as much as $8 trillion of public equity enterprise value is going to evaporate in the next two decades or at least be transformed into something else. It's going to affect real people in the auto manufacturing industry. You know, and I'm looking at this from an academic uh, perspective, but I realize this is real jobs, real people, and real disruption for auto manufacturing and for the oil industry, and well beyond that into the auto service industry. Like, what's going to happen with people who own and work at oil change stations? What's going to happen to gas stations? I, some of them are still going to be around, some of them will be converted to charging stations, but you know, something like 60% of people in the United States own their own home and can charge at home. We won't need that many uh, charging stations. What's gonna to happen to auto parts store as more and more of these cars are taken off the road? What's gonna to happen to people who train to be mechanics like diesel mechanics? Um, you don't need as much maintenance uh, for an electric vehicle. And you know, dealerships like car dealerships, their business model is really based on maintenance. A lot of them actually make more money maintaining vehicles than they do on profits by selling you a vehicle. There's basically nothing to maintain an electric motor. You might have some, uh, some suspension issues in the car. Uh, if your motor breaks, just replace it. It's literally, it has like 20 moving parts and an internal combustion engine usually has somewhere between two and 3,000 parts. So there's just a lot more to go wrong. Now in the United States, Tesla has set themselves up as a near unassailable monster in the electric vehicle market. Uh, what they really have, you know, the advantages they really have are, you know, a dominant market leading brand. Like Tesla 
not only has a reputation of, as being a great uh, you know passenger vehicle in the sort of luxury space, everyone knows that they're trying to move down market and provide that mass market vehicle to us. It is an American company. We would prefer to buy American cars if we have a choice. Uh, they make great products and they have a huge technological and software advantage, at least for the time being. None of their domestic competitors or companies really with aspirations to compete uh, because really they don't have any revenues in most cases and in many cases they don't have any real products. And I'm talking about companies like Workhorse, Nikola, Rivian, Faraday Future, Lucid Motors. Many of these companies are going public using these special acquisition companies and reverse mergers. Uh, they're going public and taking investor money before they've ever delivered their first product to anyone. Many of them are going to fail. It's going to be for a variety of reasons for each company, but a lot of it's going to have to do with the dominance of Tesla. This is absolutely not the case with the uh, electric vehicle market in China. There isn't a dominant player with a clear technological manufacturing or branding advantage. And uh, if ever one does carve out such a tech advantage, no one's going to respect the intellectual property rights of competitors uh, in China, especially of their domestic rivals. Now, if you've been staring at this list for the last few minutes and you think this list of dead automakers in the US looks like a bloodbath, the one prediction I can confidently make with a high degree of certainty about the future of the Chinese electric vehicle market is that it's going to be even more competitive and even more of a bloodbath. The EV manufacturing revolution in China is absolutely going to dwarf what occurred in the United States in the early 20th century. It's going to look a lot like the California gold rush had babies with the industrial revolution and the only thing their mama fed it was steroids, cash, and the souls of assembly line workers. If you've never seen one of these vast industrial and technological parks in China, it's really difficult to understand the scale at which China can make things and how they can develop. Now, I haven't even seen one of these things in a long time. It's been 20 years since I've actually been to China itself. But I remember going to the Pearl River Delta and seeing all of the manufacturing capability there and just being stunned, stunned at everything that was going on there. And that's not even some of the largest, I mean, some of the largest uh, manufacturing centers aren't even located in that area. Now, in the period from 1900 to 1940 in the United States, when those 1,030 plus companies that manufacture cars were founded, the population in the United States was only 76 million and grew to 131 million by 1940. The population of China today is roughly 1.4 billion people. It's already the largest car market in the world. 21 million vehicles were sold there last year. There's already more than 130 car brands to choose from. And China has already made itself into a leader in lithium ion battery manufacturer, solar cell manufacturer, and it's absolutely intent on doing this in the EV space as well. There are tons of multinational corporations and venture capital for firms that are more than willing to pour money into the manufacturing hubs of China. I think we're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of new electric vehicle startups in the coming years. The technology to make a, uh, an electric motor and the batteries just isn't as complex as people might think it is. And Tesla also all, you know, already made all of their uh, patents publicly available. You can use their technology as long as you're not outright copying it. Predicting a winner this early in the game, at this stage in the game, and going all in, high concentration in any of these publicly traded electric vehicle players in China, I think it's really a loser's game for most investors. There's just too much that we don't know about what's going to happen in that electric vehicle space in China. It's going to be a 21st century Mad Max style capitalist free for all. Luck and the capricious nature of Chinese millennial fashion tastes to a large degree are going to be some of the biggest factors that determine who is a brand winner in this Chinese EV space. I think it's impossible to predict with any certainty which companies in China are going to have explosive Tesla-like growth. Now, if you're a student of history, you would know that for much of recorded history prior to the Taiping Rebellion in the 1850s, China was the wealthiest, most technological advanced society on the planet. That really isn't in question by historians. The last 150 years of Chinese history may eventually be looked on by historians 
as a mere interruption in that technological and financial leadership in the world. I think that many of the moves that the Chinese government made in the early 2000s, uh, inadvertently, I don't think EVs were actually on their radar at this time, but they have perfectly prepared the country for this moment. They're already a leader in EV adoption because the government has really decided to sponsor manufacture of electric vehicles, and they've created a lot of subsidies that encourage the purchasing of them. There's actually more electric vehicles sold in China than the rest of the world combined. One of the most important possibilities, though, that I think many people are not considering is that China may actually be a leader in the disruption of the idea of car ownership entirely. Uh, car ownership penetration in China is actually very, very low compared to the Western world. And I can easily imagine a future in which much of the middle class in China moves around by autonomous taxi. And we have high-end subscription services to companies like Neo, BOID, or Xpeng that replaces outright ownership. There just really isn't a way to predict this at this time. Now, I am betting big on China as a whole to be a dominant player in the future of electric vehicle manufacturing. And I really think that many people in the future around the world are gonna be driving Chinese-made electric vehicles just like in the past, or even today, many people drive a Japanese internal combustion engine car. I personally am probably going to spread out my investments in Chinese electric vehicles across many, many firms. I'm not gonna limit myself to just the front runners who are already trading on US exchanges today, or even the folks that are coming in the next year or so. There's a little bit of a gold rush going on right now, and I think NEO kind of sparked that. They, people saw the sort of thousand percent plus growth, and all these other companies are saying, we need to go public now. Um, many of these companies are going to fail. There's going to be a lot of opportunity, but there's going to be a lot of heartbreak in the future of this industry. And the more I think about it, the more that I come to realize that this platform of disruptive innovation today is gonna to be where diversification is, is going to be most important. And it's also going to be the surest way to chart your path to real wealth in this space. Anyway, folks, those are just my thoughts. You can tell me how wrong you think I am in the comments below. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next time.